<clears throat> the views and opinions expressed in this podcast do not necessarily reflect those of any major corporation whatsoever. Well then, Bunwork, New Jersey. <laughs> Let's talk about books. You see, people always say, hey, Steve, what are you actually doing with that aardvark in your hands? To which I say yes. that whatever I decide to do with an aardvark and a midget and a clown and former MTV ah. VJ Mark Goodman in the privacy of my own bedroom is my own goddamn business because I'm an American. That's right. It, that's not my thing. That's Mark Goodman's thing. You don't know Mark Goodman as well as I do. People also say, hey, write what you know. And what I know is that I've been a loyal and essentially hardworking adjacent employee at my local bookstore for almost 17 years. 17 years is a long time. If my career was a person, it would be all weird and sweaty and moody and complex. So 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 does that mean that you're coming up in three years on your retirement in gold watch? Um, in three years I get like a I get like a plaque with my name on it. It's like a it's it's like a <laughs> Tiffany glass sculpture of a book with my name engraved on it. Okay. And then if I last five years after that, I believe I get a special card. That will give me the um, employee discount for the remainder of my life. See, uh, you know, see, that's what companies do when they're trying to show their appreciation, but you're like a human. So they don't know how, you know? Yeah. They yeah. don't know how. Because really, I know the gift they can give you, you know, <laughs> that you would like. Much more than that, you know, if on your 20th year, you get to start telling customers to go fuck themselves. That would be nice. There yeah. you go. Problem solved. It's, He's happy. You haven't spent any money on it. It's, you it's get all to, good you get, here. You get to choose one person in the store to, to, to lose their job. Yes. <laughs> and everybody lines up and it's like, well, take your pick. It's like, you're out of here, Randy. Mm -hmm. That would kinda, be nice. But it kind of like that. Survivor. People are trying to suck up on you, suck up to you. Yeah. As it's coming, and yeah. possibly suck up on you as yeah. it's coming up to that anniversary, right. yeah. you know, so that so yeah. that you see them favorable and don't reduce them to, to one meow meow meow. Yeah. Meow meow beans. It's all, it all comes down to the meow meow beans. And cast them out. No. As such, I really do have my fingers on the pulse of the book world, and I am here to wiggle my wet, throbbing digits in your vaguely literate face with this week's hilariously unfunny installment of Notes from the Bookstore! Well, I don't know, but I've been told you never slow down, you never grow old. I just described a vampire. Am I a vampire? Guys, guess what? Tom Petty is a vampire. Yes. Well, you kind of always knew that, didn't you? Like, yeah, no, that's, that's not surprising. Yeah. It's not surprising news in any way. In any way. Now, let's start off this week's notes from the bookstore by continuing our look at the origin of Mr. Steve. Beloved storyteller and man of a thousand screaming children. Yes. So as we begin this time around, the year is 2002. And you know, a lot, a lot of things happened yes. in the year 2002. So let's rip on them. <laughs> in the year 2002, I can't believe this. In the year 2002, Rosie O'Donnell bravely came out as irrelevant. Yes. Very brave of her. Yes. 
very brave of her. Of course, 2002 was the year that one movie and one movie alone swept the Oscars. Mr. Deeds. Mr. Deeds. Oh, my God. Yes. Everyone. I'm still kind of stuck on Rosie O'Donnell because, like, she is just one of those person. And, and, and with her, it's a lot of people, so it's definitely just not me. She just gets on my nerves. Yeah. Ever since, what? She hosts, like, when I first saw her, she was hosting a stand-up comedy show on some fairly dead planet, like uh, some fairly dead channel. I'm wanting to say VH1. Probably. So, like, this is, like, one of the first shows they've ever done, you know? They just had music, and that was it. Yeah. And it was Rosie O'Donnell, and I looked at her, and I was like, you are not funny, and you really fucking annoy me. You know? Yeah. So much like Madonna, I was I, I I I am I am very annoyed that we still have to be speaking about Rosie O'Donnell. I mean, yeah. <sighs> I think it's important to note that when we don't Rosie speak of O'Donnell, Mario Joyner. Yeah. It. I think that it's important to note that. Back when Rosie O'Donnell was hosting her very own talk show and pretending to be straight, that she would constantly talk about how she has the hots for also totally straight Tom Cruise. Yes. That that was her, hey guys, I'm totally straight and not gay. Look, I have the hots for Tom Cruise. Yes. So it's important to note that because eventually she said, oh, okay, guys, I'm coming out. I'm gay. It's like, but what about Tom Cruise? Oh, okay. All right. <laughs> that I, is called I, a beard. I, I, yeah, I get it. Wink, wink. Yes. 10-4. I read you loud and clear. <laughs> Mr. Deeds swept the Oscars. America just fell in love with the love affair between Adam Sandler and um, fresh from court Winona Ryder. <laughs> of course, um, Mr. Deeds was followed closely by Star Wars Episode Two: Attack of the... Wait, do these movies suck? <laughs> was the full title of that film. In 2002... George W. Bush created the Department of Homeland Security to deal with the rising threat of Avril Lavigne songs. Yes. And and I supported him on that. Yeah. Because, like, that was, you're not the guy. Yeah, that is way before someone chucked a cupcake at her. Yes. Back when she, she was still hanging out at malls. Yes. In, in 2002, the number one album in America was the Eminem show. Finally, a voice for white males. <laughs> Way too underrepresented in America. Yes. Finally. Here's a true story. Here's a true story from 2002. Um, this weird story comes to us from Florida because, of course... In celebration of Martin Luther King Day, the town of Lauder Hill, Florida, invited actor and, I'm assuming, humanitarian James Earl Jones to speak at the, at the town hall. And then they had a parade for him. Nice. And in celebration, they even had a plaque made to honor him. And if and they were honoring him because quote he was keeping the dream alive. James Earl Jones, Martin Luther King Day. It, it, okay. it seemed to be a good fit. Yes. However, in a wee bit of an oopsie daisy, <laughs> the plaque that was created accidentally was made. In honor of James Earl Ray. Oh, my God. The man who 
killed Martin Luther King. Oh, that's, that's horrible. It was, actually, it was actually just an accidental typo. Apparently, the guy who made the plaque was making a bunch of other plaques, and one of the plaques was for a guy who had the last name Ray. So it was oh. just kind of a really bizarre accidental mix-up that wasn't intended. But you got to know that in prison, James Earl Ray is like, finally. <laughs> God, I was wondering when I'd finally get the recognition I deserve. Where do I put my plaque? And if I was James Earl Jones... I would so keep that black. <laughs> oh, hell yeah. Hell yeah. Excuse me, but I will be keeping this plaque as well. <laughs> Simple. This plaque is mine, and this is CNN. <laughs> so what the hell has ever happened to James Earl Jones anyway, man? I don't know. Because he was the shit and he was all over anything. I haven't seen him in anything in a really long time. I don't know. The last thing I, I remember. Him. Yeah, you should. You should, it, you know, you should check on him. Yeah. Check up on him. Stop so by he, his house. He might know where Louis Gossett Jr. is. <laughs> Maybe. Also, in 2002, our hero, a totally fictional man named Steve, coincidentally enough, fictional for legal reasons, obviously, was unfortunately living with his um, girlfriend, Hurricane Debbie, and her massive family in a crumbling house in Phoenix. Yes. And at the beginning of 2002, uh, Hurricane Debbie's dad wanted Steve out of the house. Yes. Work was great. Steve drank a lot. He had very few responsibilities. Ton of friends. Plus, he was getting a bunch of press for his religion. Things were good-ish. Steve was still pretending to go to college, and when he uh, finally came clean to his girlfriend, Hurricane Debbie, she was not happy. Okay. But let me talk. Let me talk just a wee bit about Debbie before we leave uh, Debbie forever. She was five foot tall. Okay. Or so she says. I always had the theory that she was shorter, but that she didn't want to admit that. Yeah. You know? I always felt that she was 4'10, 4'11, but she she was just rounding up. And so I used so to she give would her... Be, so she would be a top. Yeah. I used to give her shit because... Uh, legally, at least, according to the U.S. government, and I believe the DMV, if you are under five feet, you are legally considered a midget. <laughs> so it's like, come on, let me measure you. No, you're not going to measure me. Are you not letting me measure you because you're afraid of being a midget? Well, I'm not a midget. I'm five foot. And I'm like, yeah, but that's still midget adjacent. <laughs> You might not be a midget, but you're you're definitely like right at the border to midget town. <laughs> I just want to know for sure if you're living in Midgetville or if you're here with the rest of us. Yes. But she never she never let me measure, her, so I just assumed. Didn't you ever measure her in her sleep? No. No. Never did. You never, so never You never Watched her walk through a doorway really carefully and then mark where her those. head was with a pencil. No? You can never trust those. I always used those when I would go into a restaurant and I'm, my my height would always change because everyone is different. Yeah. You know? You never had a group of friends 100%. wrestle her to the ground and hold her? No. But it was the dad that wanted me out of the house. The dad, I used to call AWG, angry white guy. Yes. He was old and angry, and he couldn't express emotions or feelings in any way. Essentially, he was the dad from Cloudy with a Chance of Meatballs. Okay. The animated movie Cloudy with a Chance of Meatballs is really good. It's done by the same people who did 21 Jump Street and 22 Jump Street and the Lego movie and the Lego yeah. Batman movie. And they were just fired from the Han Solo 
uh, movie. Yes. And it, the thing that I love the most about Cloudy with the Chance of Meatballs is the relationship between the father and the son is one of the most realistic father-son relationships in the history of cinema. Because yeah. the dad literally can only talk in fishing metaphors. Okay. It's like, God, I relate to that so much. Here's this dad, and he's like, the mom's like, go talk to your son. Son, when you're picking a lure, (laughs) you've got to make sure, Dad, I don't get your fishing references. (laughs) It's like, God damn, that hits home. That hits home. You know? (laughs) I think it hits home for a lot of people. Yeah. But that's the closest to uh, Angry White Guy, Hurricane Debbie's dad. This this is a good story to tell to get you to fully understand this fellow who wanted me out of the house. Yes. Um, Debbie turned. When I first met Debbie, when we were in high school, she was uh, bright and bubbly and happy and, and she, a ball of energy. And then we it went our separate ways. And then when we met up again and started dating, she was a completely different person. And she was doing a lot of drugs and partying yeah, and going to raves and yada, yada, yada. And the reason why she turned was because it, like her senior year of high school, her best friend that she spent all of her time with died in a car accident. Yeah. And the way she found out about it was the mom uh, of the girl who died called all of her friends to let them to break the sad news to them. And Debbie wasn't home. So the dad took a message and then waited for Debbie to come home. And when Debbie came home, the dad said, "Hey Debbie, you got a call when you were when you were away. Uh, what's the name of your best friend? W- what's her name? Yeah, her. She's dead. Oh, died in a car accident. And then he just kept on typing. Oh, like that's really fucked up. Yes, that is. You know, like damn." It's not enough to just be a dad. You have to freaking be there. Yeah. So I hated this man, and this man hated me. He never told me he wanted me out of the house. He told everybody else who told me. So that was fun. I had no place to stay. And uh, I'm getting a that nope. 70s show vibe off of him if you made it funny. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. I had no other goddamn choice. I called up my parents who were living in Sacramento and asked for help. They were expecting my call eventually, which hurt. Yes. Obviously. You know, hey, I I need a place to stay. Oh, we were wondering when you would call. Okay, (laughs) well, you don't have to rub salt in that wound, you sons of bitches, but okay. Um... My brother tried to stay in Phoenix and couldn't cut it either. So he had moved in with my parents, I guess, like six months before. Yes. So he was excited for me to be moving back to California. So, hey, I tried. I lasted a little over a year on my own. And as it turns out, my parents had a house in Sacramento that was literally a 12 minute drive away from Arden Mall, which had a big bookstore right next door. Yeah. So I asked I asked around about uh, the transfer process, which apparently is fairly easy. And if you remember, one of the managers at the store in Phoenix started at the Arden store. So she clued yes. me in on the store and what to expect and yada, yada, yada. She hates now, men. Yeah. Yeah. No, no. It was the nice hippie one. Oh. I was trained by two different people. It was the, the nice one and then the one who hated all penises. <laughs> now. I am at a bit of a loss here. My work in Sacramento represented the 
absolute best and worst times of my life. I became a lead bookseller. My pay went up and 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 up. I was collecting uh, raises like Pokemon. I met my wife at that job and I married her. I became Mr. Steve, the beloved storyteller, yada, yada, yada. Unfortunately, Sacramento was also the place where I was systematically picked on and written up and made to feel horrible in what numerous other managers called both, quote, a witch hunt and, quote, a sad attempt to get the highest paid employees in the store to quit. Yes. Also, robbery. So, yeah, I'm putting this story on pause for a little bit. Uh, so let's not talk about moving to Sacramento on the dirt bar and Colleen and violence for a little bit. Okay. Instead, I would like to talk about pay phones. Pay phones. Pay phones. It is exciting. I, I went and got gas the other day and I was coming at, as I was coming out of the gas station, uh, perfect symbol of Oklahoma. There was a pay phone. At the gas station, and I uh, did you I take drove, a picture? No, I drove by it all the time, and, and and it was I think it was Emerald who was in the car, and Emerald's like, "Oh my god, there's a payphone there," and I'm like, "Yeah, I guess there is. I I've never noticed that there's been payphone there this entire time, <laughs> and that's odd." I and I said, "You know what? I should go take a picture of it, but I'm not going to because I got to get her to work or something." I yeah. think. Oh, I would also have to try to see if it still works, too. Yeah. But I started work at the store in Sacramento in 2002. And when I started there, 2002, so long ago, that in the store right next to our bathrooms, there was a payphone. How long, how long, how much time has to go by? Before payphones become historic monuments, I don't know. Are there still payphones uh, by the soda machines, Bella? When you go into Walmart, I don't know if they're there anymore. They were. Yeah, when you go into Walmart in the way that we always enter, you know, right on the right, there's soda machines and the claw machine, and there were payphones. Are they still there? It's so weird because, like, it's two thousand, it's two thousand seventeen. I don't see payphones anymore. I think that there are payphones all over the place, but I'm just not looking at them. Yeah, yeah, they're there. Yeah. My my niece used to take pictures of payphones when she saw them, and every now and then we'd I'd see one. I'd take a picture and send to her. Yeah, I need to start taking pictures. I need to pay attention to payphones because I believe they're everywhere, but I just I look around them. Yeah, because yeah. we're because we're used to seeing them. Yeah, and so why... whether we see them or not, we kind of assume they're there. Yeah, and the way people are now with the uh, um, devices and cell phones, if I need to use a payphone, you yeah. know I fucked up bad. Yeah, basically, because there are so many other things that have to go wrong before I have to use a payphone in my life. Yes. My, my, my car is broken down. My phone has melted. My tablet was uh, killed by Nazis. Uh-huh. Shit, I need to use a payphone. That's, that's how low I need to get before I use a payphone. Well, because I am not germaphobic. Okay? I'm not germaphobic at all. I don't, I, you know. But those fucking things were skeezy as shit. Hell yeah, they were. Hell yeah, they were. You know, they were all, well, waxy, for one. Yeah. Which is not but, something I like from something that people hold their ears up to. Yeah. But in 2002... In 2002, and then 2003, 2004, 2005, 2006, 2007, more people are getting cell phones, more people are using cell phones, Star 69 exists, you can call people back, Um, uh, what is it, uh, uh, what is it when you, you, you call somebody and then, and then it pops up like the name, 
of the person. Call waiting? Oh, caller ID. Caller ID. Caller ID. Yeah, caller ID exists. So pay phones were getting to be on the outs. So people would go to our store and call someone on the pay phone. But then whoever they called would assume that the person who called was calling from a home phone yeah. or a cell phone. There's no way this person called me on a pay phone at a bookstore. So oftentimes, maybe two to four times during a shift, our pay phone would start ringing. <laughs> And it would ring and ring and ring. And it was almost some, it was almost always some freaking teenager trying to call their buddy back, <laughs> unaware that their buddy spent like, what, 35 cents to call them on a freaking payphone at the bookstore. And so eventually, like some of the booksellers it went to the manager and said, What do we do when the payphone starts ringing? Yeah. It's not our phone. But mm-hmm. also, should we just let this payphone ring? I mean, it's annoying and people are, are confused and it's loud as hell. It's ringing throughout the store. Like, what do we do? Yeah. And the manager specifically said, you do not have to answer the phone. You can answer the phone if you want to. But this is not a phone for our store. Right. So... You can answer it if you want and say whatever you want, but it this isn't our phone, so you don't have to worry about it. So what we took that as meaning was if the phone ever rings, you can answer it and say whatever the hell you want. Uh, I would take it that way, yes. Yeah. So anytime the phone rang, there would be at least two to three employees rushing to that freaking phone to answer it first. <laughs> most of the time, I would be in the children's department, and the children's department was near the bathroom, so most of the time, I would answer the phone first. Sometimes Nick would answer the phone, and he would literally just go, this isn't a cell phone, it's a pay phone, and then hang up. Yeah. And uh, Business- Business-like. Yeah. Jim was uh he did drugs and he was an alcoholic and so he would like to try and talk to people and like get to know them and see how long they can talk to this person sometimes he would pretend to be the person (laughs) pick up hello yeah brian is this you yeah it's me what are you doing and he would see how long he could just talk to this stranger what i would do and i think mine was the best yeah is and it was all in the delivery it was all in the delivery when you did what i did you had to do it in a voice that didn't care as if you are just a person who was hired at a desk to answer the phone in a specific way and you don't care it was in the delivery okay so i when i would run to the phone i would pick it up and say free pony rides is carlos (laughs) <laughs> and I swear to God, over a hundred times, I answered this payphone. Free pony rides. This is Carlos. <laughs> now, the surprising thing. Now, the surprising thing is that 90 to 95 percent of the time. People would just go, oh, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, this is a wrong number. And then hang up. Yeah. And I would like to think, like, two minutes later, they would go, wait, what did I just call? Like, like <laughs> it would take them a while. But eventually, they would realize, oh, my God, what was that? <laughs> so if they immediately called back, I would pretend to, to do a different voice. Okay. Hello? Hello? Who is it? You know, just to throw them off, because then they hang up the phone and go, damn it, what was that number I dialed the first time? (laughs) I swear to God, he said free pony rides. (laughs) Now, like five or ten percent of the time, 
there would be someone who would be like, wait a second, what is this? What number is this? Who did I just call? Always black. Okay. I don't know what that means. I don't know how to read into that. But it was always like the 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 other races that were like, oh, I'm sorry, it's the wrong number. But it was the black people who had the uh, the the gall, the bravery to go. Wait, what? <laughs> so so I, I I brought more into it. So, uh, free pony rides were a nonprofit organization designed to uh, bring free pony rides to inner city youth. Would you like to schedule a free pony ride today? I, I had a, I had a whole routine to try and get people to sign up for free pony rides. We go to school. We go to schools like in the inner city and get kids who would not uh, uh, otherwise have the chance to ride a pony. We get them to ride a pony. Yes. We're called free pony rides. You can go to freeponyrides.org. dot org. <laughs> I had so much fun with that pay phone. I swear to God, I cried when they finally took it down, like in 2008 or 2009. I was so sad. Like, damn it! I <laughs> love that phone! <laughs> and that was the end of freeponyrides.org. Very sad. Very sad. I miss free pony rides. Yeah. Carlos is out of a job! Carlos is out of a job. I did it sad. all the time. I did it all the time replaced by technology yeah yeah it's sad so let's leave our origin story there for now for a while possibly forever probably not let's move now onto the sales floor because there's a lot of new and best-selling books for us to talk about first off no we don't sell eclipse glasses okay (laughs) we don't Sell freaking eclipse glasses. Stop calling us. We don't sell them. Every call. Really? In retrospect, we should have sold them because everyone assumes that the bookstore sells them. That was a real missed opportunity. We would be making billions of dollars right now because of so many people coming in looking for eclipse glasses. So, missed opportunity, should have sold them, but we don't sell them. So, stop calling! Yeah, I, I haven't looked for Eclipse glasses. I would start at 7-Eleven first, I think. Yeah, or, or whatever the nearest museum is. Yes, yeah. Bella? I hate you, Bella. I just you to you. One of our biggest sellers, one of our biggest selling books for almost a year now has been the nonfiction home improvement book entitled The Magnolia Book. The Magnolia Book. The Magnolia Book, written by insufferably cutesy husband and wife team of Chip and Joanna Gaines. Okay. Chip and Joanna Gaines have a supposedly adorable HGTV home repair show, or so I'm told, repeatedly by every customer age 65 and older. (laughs) Actually, their story is pretty inspiring. They went from having nothing to having white privilege. Yes. And then to having their own media empire. That's very inspiring. Mm -hmm. It's a very inspiring story. I recently seriously injured myself at home. Uh huh. Um, I was do? cooking. I was cooking and I was boiling some water, and I wasn't paying attention. And I, apparently, I also filled up the pot too high with water, and so the water was just spilling out of the pot and going right into the burner and into the oven. And yes. I I went into panic mode. And I just, in my mind said, you need to stop that water. You need to soak up that water. So I turned off the, the fire. I turned off the gas. And then I got the pot and I moved it off the burner. And then without thinking, I grabbed the burner. Oh, yes. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. To move it. And did you I have, 
Did I you... burned myself so bad. Yeah. It hurt so much, and I was going to scream and cry, but Natasha had just put the baby down. So what I did is I didn't tell anyone for like two hours. Oh, God. And it, like I'm there sitting on the couch. Yeah. Cradling my left hand and like rubbing coconut oil all over it. I'm not sure. In my mind, I, I said it, it, I was thinking apparently rationally. And I'm like, Steve, don't turn on the cold water and put your hand under there. That will make it worse. We have coconut oil somewhere. Oh, that might... no, that's a mistake. It's the exact opposite. Really? Oh, yeah. Anyway, the coconut oil helped me out. And I'm sitting there on the couch, like, cradling my left, my burnt left hand. And, like, tears are, like, welling in my eyes. And I'm just thinking, God damn it. If I was just an alcoholic, I would be exactly like my father right now. <laughs> I hurt myself and I haven't told a soul. Yeah. That is such my family. But I, I, um, I really, I really have to, I, I hate to laugh at your pain, but I'm gonna. No, it's okay. It's um, okay. So I am imagining d- d- did you have the locking your co- keys in the car sensation as you were reaching for the burner? I, you know, you lock your keys in the car. There is that half half a second before the car door is shut. When you know you are shutting it, and you know the keys are inside, and that moment takes that forever, ever. and you cannot stop yourself. No, I didn't think of it at all. Oh. I didn't think of it at all. It's in better my that mind, way. In my mind, the only thing I was thinking of was you need to soak up that water under the burner, that that was the important thing. So without thinking, I just grabbed the burner. Thankfully, I only apparently only grabbed it with my thumb and pointer finger on my left hand. Yeah, I didn't grab it with my entire hand. So the pain was limited just to the tips of my fingers. But the negative is that I still can't feel the tip of my pointer finger. Yeah. I can't feel it at all. But I try and look at the bright side of everything, and this is why I brought this up in the Chip and Joanna Gaines uh, portion of Notes from the Bookstore. Um, The welt was so bad, and I'm looking at it, and I'm like, oh, my God, this is horrible. Oh, my God, this welt is perfectly white. (laughs) It is perfectly, oh, my God, a part of me is a white man. Yes. Oh my God! I became—I'm a white man just on one finger. <laughs> so here's my plan: I'm going to burn my entire body, oh. and then they'll let me into my son's school. Yes. When he forgets his glasses, he doesn't need glasses, but he's in this family, so it's only a matter of time. Yes. <laughs> so, yeah. So hopefully I can become like Chip and Joanna Gaines. I just need to burn my entire body. Yeah, that's that's kind of a lot to go through. Yeah, but it'll be worth it to be uh, to be Steve Schmeckle, yes. insurance agent. Yes, that's my that's my white persona. I'm very you, proud of it. You could think the cops are good. That's yeah, yeah. That's an upside. Now, now let's talk. DVDs. If, if, if I ever, ever want to change any of my political opinions, I can, and nobody would know. Yeah. Yeah. That's white privilege. Hell yeah. What's wrong now with let's... Punch Nazis? Yeah. Oh, no, the Nazis are good people. Yeah. Yeah, these, these, these aren't like those Nazis. These are the new... Uh, kinder, gentler, you know, fluffy Nazis. Yeah, I believe there's a there's a Mr. Show skit in there. <laughs> the new KKK, and they're like skipping in a park somewhere. Yeah, pushing each <laughs> other on the swings. Let's talk DVDs, DVDs and CDs. Okay. Most 
most uh, of your local bookstore have big sections for movies and big sections for DVDs, big sections for music. Most of them, most repeated for emphasis. Yes. Most. But I have worked in three different stores and have somehow never worked in a location with a DVD and a music department, which is odd, but that is weird. Every single solitary store, even if you don't have a DVD section and a CD section, every store has to sell a certain certain number of big new DVDs and big new CDs, and and including whatever the newest BBC DVD is. Even if you don't carry it? Even Even if we don't have a DVD section, there are certain DVDs that we have to get. So, like, we'll get Guardians of the Galaxy. Will we have uh, we have some Kong Skull Islands right now? Yeah, and, and apparently we have some you have sort a smattering. Of a, yeah, okay. And apparently we have some promotion with the BBC, where we carry whatever the newest BBC DVD is. Uh huh. And I'm sorry, but that is crazy stupid because there is no way that anyone has ever burst into a bookstore in a mad huff going, oh, 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 please, God, please tell me you have series three of Grant Chester. <laughs> I've been to five stores looking for series three of Grant Chester. Please, please tell me you have Grant Chester. I have a five-year-old. Well, I'm thinking more... Grant Chester. I'm thinking more like, come on. It's Oklahoma. Yeah. yeah. You got them into a bookstore. Your job is done. You know? Yeah. Expecting them to have any kind of interest in anything BBC? Oh, yeah. You know, uh, that's, that's community college level, and it's just too advanced. Yeah. Yeah. And finally... Finally, this week, I recently, honestly and for true, this is a 100% true story. I recently went to my store manager with what I believe to be a revolutionary new idea that will no doubt change the game at your local bookstore, nay, at retail outlets everywhere. Okay. Revolutionary, revolutionary paradigm shift, some third phrase. I work in mornings mostly, and there is one thing that always fills up our mornings our mornings, our afternoons. And so I thought, hey, let's utilize this yes. as a brand new way to maximize sales, increase our sales percentage, and some third business-sounding thing. Yes. So here's my idea. And I literally went to the manager with this idea. This is absolutely true. I was looking around, trying to think of a way to drum up some money for the store. What if we start charging customers for naps. Oh. First off. That's a good idea. Very, very, very Japanese. Yeah. I can't think of any other retail environment where people can go, oh, man, finally, we got into Target. Now I'm going to take a nap. (laughs) No one does that. But why does everyone do it here (laughs) so often? Because you so have many times. Because you have good, comfortable chairs. But the, I think the big question: Where are you going to curl up in in a Target? Yeah, no. Yeah. Well, at least they have. I was going to say at least they have beds, but they got those like skinny beds. Yeah. For display purposes, I don't know. They do have some nice patio stuff. Yeah. Real nice patio section with some really nice comfy, like, um, pretty sure they have, um, what are those things that they swing? 
I'm trying to, I forgot the word. I'm such a professional, I'm such a professional podcaster, you know, outside and it's between two trees and then people swing it. on, they fall a hammock. There you go. Okay. Yeah. Um, you could take a nap in there maybe, but, <laughs> but what do you, what should I charge per nap? You know? Uh, yeah. I would go twenty four ninety nine for an executive power nap. Uh, it would be about a thirty minute nap, and then I would increment from there. So I would go, uh, say, seventy five for a deluxe nap, which would be a full hour. I am quite impressed by how easy that came for you <laughs> i was quite impressed i thought this would be a time that we could hash it out but god damn you've got a blueprint well places places where you could take naps exist and i saw them on some show i don't know what the fuck it might have been it was just a little bit on some show where where they were showing you a place where you could take a nap in Manhattan. It was way more fucking expensive than that, but you get put into your own little pod with your choice of music, and they give you a blanket, shut the pod, and you go to sleep. Nice. I'd be down with that. So I'm familiar with the business model. <laughs> yeah, yeah, good. I'm glad I asked you. You're definitely a man in the know. And that is it for notes from the bookstore this week. And remember, kid sickles, you too can save 10% on all of your purchases. And all you have to do is take less than three days to denounce freaking Nazis. Yes. This is definitely the part where I stopped writing over the weekend. <laughs> Right here is where I stopped and then continued on Monday. <laughs>